Are you caught up in front of your current nightmarish 24 hour newsfeed about everything that could take away all the physical things you love just to then get overwhelmed by that little soul breaking extra bit of dread from a headline saying that all the digital things you could potentially love might be taken away too? Long sigh of agreement? Then maybe this video about the suddenly too fast closing digital store doors and the video game preservation that needs to follow is just for you and your need to become even more consumed by worries. Now just to prevent some misunderstandings from immediately dragging your already stressed existence even deeper into the unpredictable realms of nitpicky disappointment, here are some disclaimers. I am not a lawyer or a professional archivist or someone working in the video game industry or someone who can reliably snap with a finger. Like how do people do that? Besides that, we, uh, I meant I, don't normally do informational videos about relatively current sad video game news. Instead, this channel is mostly focused on weird video game reviews with current sad real life news on the side because I can't hide from those news articles either. <coughs> and just as a warning, this here is a result of as much research as the pandemic allows, filtered through my really specific brain. Additionally, this video, despite the length, can of course also not portray all aspects of this really wide field of a topic. As another point, with this video I also am not personally making particular individuals responsible for video game loss. To love in hindsight is always the easiest thing, especially if you were not in the situation those people were. Uh, what else? Uh, pet every cat that allows you that? Eat more vegetables if possible, I guess? And I don't know, write people you like a nice email or something for a change? I, I really don't know. But what the tap again? After some scary rumors rippled through gaming news sites, Sony opened the dam on the 29th of March 2021 with the announcement that the PS3 and PSP store would end operation at the start of July. Subsequently, the store of the PS Vita, a console in terms of Western unit sales considered a flop, but now blessed with a still active niche fanbase of players and developers, was intended to start sleeping with the fishes in August. That however was not a sucker punch by any means. A few months prior, the wearing signs had already started floating through the air when Sony seemingly clumsily removed the option to buy those legacy titles via an internet browser of your choice, forcing players to stumble their way through the unoptimized PS3 store that feels like it is kept together by three really brave rubber bands to accidentally spend their money on Jet Set Radio for PS Vita instead of the PS3 version, but those things are literally named the exact same, but I at least got my money back! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say... I like seemingly everybody else with 2020 cinema and convention money left unspent, went into something I would call... Panic purchase mode. The atmosphere only soured more when people remembered, in my opinion, ignorant comments by Sony Interactive Entertainment CEO Jim Ryan. The PS5, in contrast with its direct competition for the price of most not available thing right now, the Series X consoles, only having backwards compatibility with titles of the last console generation. And Sony only letting you stream some PS3 games via the PS Now service, which according to most reports is as close to a flipbook as you would expect. Meanwhile, people made videos about what to get before all the stores turned into only a distant memory or prepared their PlayStation obituaries. 
When the Earth shook, even more with tension, as the inside came into prominence that all Sony consoles beginning with the PS3 have a time battery that, when dead, can make most of it a really decorative rock if you can't get it to connect to the PlayStation servers, that someday will also be eaten by the sinkhole of time. Following that revelation, many people panicked so much that Sony reportedly was looking into the issue at least, I guess. And finally, on April 19th, you could hear all of a sudden a small collective breath of relief when this PlayStation Block entry released, stating that Sony had revised their decision at least for the PS3 and Vita store in the face of the backlash. The overall problem, however, still hangs dangerously above our heads. The scary shadow of something so fleeting, like a gaming service, was known throughout the history of the medium. During the 16-bit era, there were already attempts at non-physical video game distribution. Nintendo had the Japanese-only Famicom Satellite Broadcasting Service, logically named Satellaview, with its own by radio commentators and nothing else in accompanied version of The Legend of Zelda, and Sega tried its hands in America with the Sega Channel, that famously housed the American release of Mega Man The Wily Wars. Due to us not existing in a world where we furiously argue if the Sega Channel DX HD Game Pass or the Switch Satellite View Plus Now Ultra Fun or something is the better deal, you can guess where those experiments and the games that came with them ended up. Even before that existed for example game distribution services like the dial-up game line for Atari 2600 that I did not make up. Besides only a few crumbled dream castles and phantoms came in the following years with the victory march of the internet in the 7th console generation, the maybe vast majority of potential lost online gaming things. And subsequently happened what had to happen. What I consider to be the first important closure of a modern online store section with the Xbox Live Indie Game Service in 2017. Sorry people regularly bringing flowers to the grave of the original Xbox Live since 2010, but I wanted to let you mourn in peace, okay? But unrelated to that, the DSiWare shop also saw its end in 2017, when the Wii shop sell its goodbyes in 2019 and now we are here. And this was only the start of a potential avalanche of major online services and their content ceasing to exist in the next few years. But even offline games can fall between the cracks. In the most fundamental way, actually. The forward section? Here your daily dose of funny terminology. What is a gold copy and what is a source code? Unprofessionally explained in a way that I at least can understand. Which can mean anything? This video file here, that you are watching right now, is say a retail copy of a game, the generically named original video file, which I uploaded onto YouTube, that gets compressed and distributed onto your unprotected screens, will be the gold copy. This gold copy is compiled from the gold source code slash the finished original video editor file, with all the weird assets that you can see in the end product. Outside of that, there are of course also hard drives full of unfinished backups of the source code and the video editor file because computers satiate themselves on human misery. All this is of course only an analogy that does not 110% work because you can tinker more with the files on a retail game disc than a video file. But what I wanted to say, you can lose both because digital life is also mean. This, of course, has happened to big companies, right when someone realized that you can make money off humans' inherent laziness, preventing them from getting their old consoles hooked up on their TVs again. Without the original source code, the developers of the HD remaster of Kingdom Hearts 1 had to reconstruct the majority of the game from the ground up. A disc with the gold source code for the original StarCraft disappeared, just to then reappear in 2017 on eBay. Thankfully, someone bought it and returned it to Blizzard. Sadly, by that point, the StarCraft 1 remaster was almost finished, but at least the nice finder got some goodies. 
There has of course also probably one of the most infamous gold source code losses ever. When for the PS2 Silent Hills came the time for one of those PS3 remaster compilations, it suddenly became apparent that over the years of maybe ritualistic bonfire burnings of Team Silent members, favorite childhood plushies, the gold source code for those games had vanished. And Konami could only provide the remaster developers with unfinished files. In the end, the crash between old bugs and a strict deadline was a messy firework, the afterglow of which is still lingering in the air to this day. There are of course some development studios with a storied history that have eternal archives, but those seem sadly to be more an exception in the industry. This maybe stems from the development into an accepted art form every medium that contains humans has to go through. Not to be judgmental, but I suspect during the early Rockstar era of game development, many developers probably thought more about the next cool game show, interview, their sick motorcycle, and nice small talks with models about their hobbies or whatever, than the boring fact that the future will leave them old and their creations vulnerable. Before you become too smug, when did you last ponder about your retirement funds? Me neither. <coughs> Nowadays, I would presume that most developers have a desire to keep their creations alive. If that would be feasible, however, is oftentimes the try at Universe Lottery. Maybe their studio closes and their game's IP falls into law limbo. Maybe the smaller studios just don't have the facilities for fancy storage. Or maybe someone of those several hundreds or even thousands of employees at the bigger studios have accidentally thrown out the wrong thing in midst of a confusing spring cleanup. Perhaps the video game gods even let a natural disaster strike. We can't however just ignore the big asteroid facing the earth called capitalism. I now do not want to simply blame every money person in a video game company for everything, because I don't know any of those people personally and their exact intentions are probably somewhere floating in a vague money cloud printed with their employees tears. Just why? But it's just… Preserving costs money because it takes space, care and love. In a capitalistic society, in my personal opinion, sadly too often only profitability matters. There was a reason why thousands of unsold copies of E.T. were just dumped into the deserts of New Mexico to spite the local haunted population instead of taking up warehouses. In the same vein, many higher ups in today's tech firms that want to impress with new graphic demos probably don't see financial reasons to keep objectively inferior tech alive. Continued game preservation, like all preservation, is not glamorous. It does not give you more than a fleeting additional bit of positive media coverage and a lack of interest by the big mainstream that naturally seems to gravitate more towards the new big blockbuster. Here again, I have to positively mention Microsoft making the Xbox Series X and to some extent the S backwards compatible. Is it a long term solution? The management could change and this feature could be thrown out with the next console generation or even a simple revision like the original PS3 model. And it does not support all those Kinect games, apparently. And while I was finalizing this script, Modern Vintage Gamer uploaded a video showcasing that games emulation and digital games seem to only run with an internet connection on the Series X, even if there seems to be a workaround solution that works. But still, also apparently you require an internet connection to set a console up in the first place and those servers will not always be there. Obviously, I don't have a Series X and so I can't verify it personally, but Modern Vintage Gamer is probably more knowledgeable than I regarding this topic. Maybe this will be fixed by the time this video comes out, but this is still a thing that happened. Nevertheless, 
At the moment, other parts of the industry, like Nintendo, put out FOMO the limited physical and online release and FOMO the limited digital release. Take out games from older consoles eShops because they ported them for a higher price to new shiny hardware. And now build Joy-Cons for said hardware that would probably not last nearly as long as a DS Lite in the presence of easily frustrated 12-year-old me. Or like Sony let their old stores fall into this repair, give out only really short notice of their potential closure and also stuff with the DualSense controller. But I am not part of the 4.5 people that can play Destruction all Stars together every Wednesday or so and before someone with a PC forgets reality. You know Steam and all the other storefronts will probably be closed someday too, unless Gabe Newell achieves immortality or something. And don't let me start on getting stuff like the original Sims to run on modern computers. Let's just say, no big party in this debate is perfect. Some seem to try more, some seem to try less. But what about all those remakes, non-FOMO remasters, really limited re-releases and mini consoles? It appears like they are happening more than ever, right? I don't need an internet connection to turn on my SNES mini. You can make money off the past, right? Nowadays, remasters, when functioning, often but not always cement many DLCs on physical media as a definitive edition. It's better than nothing, I guess, but I… And here I don't want to play unskillful table tennis with your hope as a ball. Think this new retro trend should not lead you to a false sense of security? All those mini consoles and remaster trilogies feature only a few mostly prominent titles, almost always games considered good. Who has the authority to objectively judge what is good or bad art? I, I at least don't think it's possible. Therefore, in my opinion, we should try to preserve everything that does not with its sheer existence. Break laws, for example, concerning someone's personal human dignity. Even if there probably also has to be a debate when, for example, filmed atrocities become historical sources that need to be protected. Technically speaking, with an applicable question, everything can actually become an important historical source. So, I don't know. I am torn on that issue, to be honest. But back to the lighter topic. What about all the unknown things that don't fall into that category? What about the things considered bad? All these things had to be created by someone's countless work hours. The unpopular, the odd, and the questionable quality things should, in my opinion, be preserved too. Even if just so future societies can learn from their achievements and their mistakes. This naturally also includes stuff I personally don't like and would not want to sit in the same room with or even let my worst enemies play. We now of course have reached a point where cult classics get a second chance, especially when they do not need to be released physically. But what about the even more unknown? No one will ask for a functioning remaster of something they have never heard of. Who will make a remaster of Silent Hill Book of Memories? Uh. But maybe another older medium that also experienced this flippant stage of not really caring about its past has a possible solution for our problem. During its first years, was the cinema considered nothing more than a short-lived, slightly confusing circus attraction? Movie directors traveled from fair to fair, showing off their newest, otherworldly creations to make money. Even when the film settled down and became feature length, the respect in the people that made them didn't seem to grow with it. The rather small supply of projection prints rented out to cinemas most likely ended up cannibalized to repair the few functioning prints left for old films fading out of the projectors. If you think that that is a bad starting point for preservation, I have to introduce you to an aspect that will probably make you think that video games may be, more on that later, have it easy. 
old nitrate film stock used till the early 1950s is really fragile when not stored properly. And as Inglourious Basterds taught us, in really flaming fashion can become really, really dangerous, which only gets worse the older the stock gets. Therefore, often film material that ended its run was just simply burned in the backyards because it was such an extreme fire hazard in the cinema. Other things people did to film material include destroying film stock for the silver contents, having to contractually destroy it because they wanted to make a remake, throwing out film stock to free up space on film walls that were considered good when, quote, the film could be stolen, or to reduce fire insurance, letting original negatives rot into a sticky, powdery block due to someone forgetting to regularly look after it. The comedian Harold Lloyd burying 27 of such decomposing negatives of his films, but he at least made copies beforehand. Someone cutting silent movies into stock footage. And statistically speaking, and this is only my unprofessional speculation, some old timey person on this planet totally tried to eat some film stock at least once. But you are likely still thinking about exploding film strips, aren't you? The vast majority of the filmography of probably the far removed unconscious inspiration for all of your favorite vampire people. Fida Bauer went boom with the 1937 Fox Vault fires, like around 40,000 other film reels. Then nobody let that happen again, right? In 1965, a spark laughed at the arrogance of the MGM film walls and incinerated everything that came in its way. But due to, among other things, MGM not stuffing everything in one place like a bored college student existing in the face of procrastination. This at least ended with less movies completely going up in smelly smoke. Then, finally, influenced by, for example, the need to fill time slots on TV with old movie reruns, many companies began to copy films to less flammable stock, but what was lost by that point was probably lost in the ether to forever frustrate the completionist media consumer types. At least after that, nothing else did reportedly happen because everyone learned their lesson. Add to that film degrading like the summer night's dream of a slushy in certain high humidity regions, censorship that lets people smuggle their controversial film footage to France, and the odd natural disaster or war, and where you get the fact that most science but also some modern films are now considered to be completely gone. Meanwhile, no one doing their swimming routines in money seemed to cry a tear after the past, or to quote this really helpful article not by the actor or the baseball coach, but by the film historian David Pierce. These very successful businessmen did not look to the past or base their business decisions on sentiment if they gave the silent films any thought at all. While the silent films might have been their films, it was also their money. They did not want to watch these films, let alone preserve them. In an industry built on youth, these executives may have presented the films that reminded them and others how long they had been around. Movies are better than ever. If an old film was any good, it would be remade. If there was no significant market for silent films, then that was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you see the parallels staring back at you now? Of course, I have to mention here that the being recognized as an important medium part of game and movie history is not 242% comparable because around the first world war the early cinema got a mainstream societal utility with newsreels and <coughs> they could be used for propaganda. But I digress. So. The decision-making people in the industry mostly seem to only care if it makes money. Not everything makes money. What if we move the responsibility into other people's hands? The rising prominence of bigger film archives transferred much of the preservation from horror worlds, private collecting Jesuit priests from Switzerland? and universities to a more centralized institution where restoration was now a possibility. 
The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Gold Statues, for example, has an archive with approximately 240,000 items, including famous director's first attempts at the next Citizen Kane with 13, and every Best Picture and Best Documentary Film winner and many of the other nominated movies. Probably only one of these involving people annoying octopi for one summer. By the way, while I personally am of the optimistic opinion that we should at least try to preserve mostly everything, but I also think that a hypothetical preservation of so much stuff also means that we should not make everything of those preserved material accessible just really nilly. While this of course is not really realistic with the internet and all, archives and museums can provide next to say propaganda films or games context, evaluation and essential background information concerning their harmful ideologies and thereby possibly educating people. But before we leave the movie segment behind, one more thing. It does make sense that the Oscar archives have set their goals as collecting scientifically and culturally important home videos about Los Angeles? But what did industrial and educational film do to the AMPAS? Um, so looking at movies, maybe such a public archive could remove the workload from the gaming industry. Perhaps this is already happening at this very moment. Before this video stumbles into the physical archives, to make this seem structured, I will now distinguish between 2.5-ish types of video game preservation that I have, I have made up right now and therefore are not of some official metric by the European Federation of Vaguely Human-Shaped Life Forms on YouTube. Let's say showcase preservation would encompass recorded gameplay footage. Naturally, in that case you would not have a grasp on the gameplay feel, but you can at least see what the visual and audio components were for the most part. Ignoring stuff like different frame rates, controller sounds, video footage compression. Even without an archive, it does not look that bad on that front. YouTube is a seemingly never-ending dark dimension, overflowing with video walkthroughs of perhaps most things a human brain can find in, find in an internet rabbit hole? Maybe with the exception of unflashy things like gaming storefronts and you would need better searchability overall, I think? There we also don't want to think about YouTube shutting its doors in maybe 50 years or so? Because positivity is a swear good these days, as sand. Of course it is sand. And where we don't want to consider the internet, as we Germans say, doing the hanky panky in front of God. Just kidding. I made that up. Here, I have tricked some of those viewers that may exist for two seconds into believing that the country that gave the world Freie Körperkultur and the subtitles of the Xenosaga games would also come up with such a saying. I played you like a pheromine, I think. I don't know how a pheromine works. <clears throat> Moving on to complete preservation that would allow the world of the future to play those games. Where I would separate between functional preservation, where everything runs on emulators, and say complete authentic preservation with original hardware, which I think would be the area of expertise and focus of a physical archive. As an example of a video game archiving project, this video will now take a look at the Library of Congress, because it is the maybe most public project and they had like recorded a really helpful presentation on their video game section in 2019. Outside of that, there are also other non-profit organizations like the Video Game History Foundation, the Game Preservation Society and many smaller projects. But now to the Library of Congress. 
starting in the late 70s, the library began accumulating a sort of video game index through copyright registration applications that to this day have to provide half an hour of gameplay footage or other identifying material and a short description. With game acquisitions and private donations, this grew over the years into an actual archive. In 2019, it had 5000 physical games, which sounds like a big number, only understandable to a calculator, but according to a 2011 article, the library back then got only approximately 10% of all physical game releases per year. This number looks even tinier when you hear that most of these 5000 games are described as CD-ROM titles from the late 90s to the early 2000s. Most of those are due to the infamous early research focus on the childhood influence of video games, mostly either educational or extremely violent games. Mortal Kombat and or the explorer aficionados had never such an occasion to shake hands. At this point, I really don't want this video to become a training opportunity for the International Hope Destroyer Championships 2022, but... According to Statista, on Steam in 2020 alone, over 10,000 digital games saw their crowded release. The Library of Congress employees have started digitizing the manuals and the physical game discs they do have, but that is just a really small droplet in the bucket. This, of course, is not meant as an accusation against the Library of Congress. Video games can become pretty expensive, and if that was the only hurdle in the medium itself. A non-exhaustive list of further complicating factors also includes <sighs> No streamlined standards for preserving and cataloging games, different game versions for different platforms with the same name and yearly releases, copyrighted music, brands, actor faces, cars and weapons, rip-offs, big bulky arcade machines, different controllers and accessories for different consoles, every physical collector fun thing, changes between re-releases, nowadays game files often taking up more hard drive space than a film and you need a specific console or emulator to run them, game bugs, everything that is coated in that 2000s plastic, cables being cables, servers being all over the place, this crud, internal batteries or copy protection in some arcade machines and consoles, interesting rare console variations, those Famicom kiosk thingies, those Donkey Kong cereals, mobile games, browser games, LCD games, cancelled games, cancelled 90s gaming mascot cartoon shows, handheld screens dying, cartridge batteries dying, online only games dying and dying questions like how to preserve timed online events or online multiplayer titles, how do other people want to get a chocobo hat in Final Fantasy XV, what about documentation on the development of games, something like the DVD extra has sadly as of time of writing not become a standard in most games. And what about leaks, and mods, and gaming conventions, and rumors, and art collaboration DLC, and demos, and this RE2 remake one-shot demo social network event, life-sized Leon S. Kennedy bust, and my hopes and dreams! Uh, out of the fourth cycle and back to the library. At least as of 2019, it also was made up of 3000 strategy guides, 25 gaming platforms, whatever that means exactly, and a vaguely defined number of what was described as printed out source codes. That sounds cool. Everything pancakes and duck rocking drums, right? Not to prepare your hope as a sad topping for a guilty pleasure cup noodle that will pollute the seven seas in the next century. But this source code is part of the copyright application for unique gameplay mechanics. Something like the Nemesis system probably has a code example in the Library of Congress. 
But this, as far as I understood it, does not mean that we have the entire Shadow of Mordor source code in a folder entombed under three issues of rats for today's pet owner from the publishers of Critters USA magazine or even can let you play the game. If any of that was the case, every lawyer of every big publisher would probably burn the entire solar system to the ground faster than nitrate film stock ever could. And there we have maybe the biggest difference between this gaming and for example the Oscars archiving project. While the AMPAs has its many issues to work on, the organization does have the film industry on its side. It was founded by industry people and its members, including everyone who was ever nominated for or won an Oscar, are also all part of the entertainment industry, even if they never set foot into the archive building. Such a direct connection to the industry is in my humble assessment as good of a prerequisite for an archive as you can have. Of course, video games have only been a thing for decades, but in my opinion? That should not mean that the industry has to crawl the entire beaten track of trials and tribulations to Preservation Mountain all over again to come to the conclusion maybe we should save our history despite having a role model right there. But even if the close industry ties were there, the archives can't make the preserved things, with certain things as mentioned earlier being exceptions, accessible to everyone. Buildings can only let in so many people. Also, what we have preserved in there can't be 100% safely stored for all of time. To bring up an example to poke your hope into despair. In 2009, the historical archive of Cologne and two nearby buildings collapsed, killing two people and burying 90% of the archival material under dust and debris. While the rebuilding of the archive itself was finished last year, the restoration of as much of these documents as possible is still ongoing to this day and is estimated to need in its entirety 30 years. This can theoretically happen with any physical existing archive. Not really likely, but still. So, looking at those aspects, authentic physical preservation seems to me at least not to be the most efficient way to go in terms of simple preservation. It of course will be a really important part of it, but preservation in its entirety? There has to be an easy, functional solution that can store more things and is less likely to be completely eliminated. Hmm, what about something unofficial? Hundreds of fan translators have made games available to more parts of the world. Fan patches fix otherwise forgotten cult classics. Fan servers revived at online games. Fans even excavated many of those satellite view games for Zelda's sake. And a prototype of the game line exclusive title Save the Whales. Yeah, you thought you wouldn't hear of that service again, didn't you? Furthermore, preservationists and collectors have amassed tons of the games that did have a non dial up release. And hear me out, many pirates, regardless of their intentions, have preserved retro games. Hear me out! A resetterer forum user by the name Eowyn, sorry for that pronunciation, brought up an, in my opinion, interesting thought experiment. For long-term preservation, you theoretically have to constantly duplicate the file being preserved, because over time, copies will start to go bad or corrupt. If you stop duplicating, there will be no offset for the loss. Of course, this has its limits, because you, in this preservation pyramid scheme, will run out of functioning hard drives and people to get copies and the internet has to keep on existing and the sun will burn this planet to a crisp eventually, but do you know who among others 
constantly spreads digital files inside a really far-reaching communication network where most people can download a copy without bigger obstacles to their hard drive? Us pirates! Arr! Uh, I meant from pirates. Only downloading doesn't count, does it? <laughs> Nintendo, please don't sue me. I, I have never downloaded anything ever in my life. <coughs> uh, those people made accurate digital copies of probably most games ever physically released. Just like the workers at the Library of Congress do with their collection. Here, I of course have to clarify that pirating contemporary games, especially indie games, harms the industry when the pirates save of the sales away. On the other side, you can also argue that not every pirate would have bought those games in a piracy-free world to begin with, or even has the financial means to do so. But before the ship here loses course again. No! Not to laugh at your hope while it is down weeping itself to sleep at your haunted late grandparents' house that will be torn down in the next two minutes for a fast fashion shop with probably bad working conditions. But even that accidental preservation has limits. Some platforms are just not really popular, or are really technically complicated, or according to my phone calculator, belong to a Googleplex of breakout or punk loans. Statistically speaking, time will elevate those problems a bit, but now? Some emulation spheres are at least in my personal experience not as universally child's play easy as some people running say PS3 games in 4K 100 FPS on their PC may be made with the same science magic that created every single superhero named Speed, Quick or Flash in that exact order will proclaim why the completely non-functioning titles are few and far between, there are however also many titles that at least now just don't run that well on emulators. Not to talk down the sheer achievement of all those emulation groups getting most things to run in the first place. But for example, Sims 1 on PS2 was intended to be the nostalgic centerpiece of their uh, I met my herbs video. Just to not get past the section where you can grace your non herb with the elegant name Dummy Dumbbell Tube Tupicton Senior. Now, to address the elephant that is probably violently roaming through your head since I started this segment, naturally all those pirates, but even many of the more grey area fan efforts ended up running into swift legal warfares. Especially Nintendo made bones tremble by for example sending DMSA takedowns to the Metro 2 fan remake AM2R and by suing several retro ROM hosting sites. Despite the Nintendo online service not looking like it will be flooded with many more of their old titles. Is that in their rights? Yeah. Have some people used their hosting sites to generate more money than probably necessary? I don't know how much servers cost, but maybe? Is the closure of those sites nevertheless bad for preservation and the community? In my opinion, yes! And there are probably many more of those lawsuits by other publishers. Too many to name in a video game video with a random movie history section. So at the current time, this is also not a reliable solution. I kinda ran out of options. Maybe I I can just scrape something off the back of my head. Um I don't know. Not purposefully destroy your old Wii with muscle marsh on it. Don't scream at a 15-year-old with a hard drive full of PS2 ROMs. Support some preservation projects with donations? Pray to every deity that will listen for a discord miracle? Hope for a copyright reform? Or more backwards compatibility being patched in? I don't know. Maybe... 
how do people communicate nowadays? Maybe send a constructive, non-insulting or threatening letter to video game publishers asking them nicely to care more about in-house preservation because they, hopefully, are sitting on the most fundamental versions of these important art pieces. Regardless of how many retail copies of Spongebob Squarepants the movie PC adventure game you send to an archive. While protecting those games in their base forms, behind museum walls could be a part of the solution. It would, however, as mentioned earlier, still leave game accessibility questions open. Piracy would probably not keel over in a perfect archiving preservation scenario, even if it would lose some of the preservation reasoning. In the best case, developers could release the source codes of older games free online, like John Carmack did with the original Doom. But copyright, again, is a never-ending rotating nightmare maze of madness run by a cartoon mouse. If any big gaming publishers listen to this, somehow, during their busy days of making origami cranes out of money, first of all, project cross zone free, then, second, I will now state my opinion, slowly, so you can make notes. If I somehow ended up being you, I would not complain about people getting their fix of Klonoa Beach Volleyball somewhere else if you don't have legal options for easy purchase. When it is all-encompassing, easy and affordable, many pirates probably would change their ship's destination and pay for your easy PlayStation, Nintendo or online game pass, like many people did with legal movie streaming services like Netflix. Even if, again, this only remains this good until the service, as we Germans actually say, bites the grass. Yeah, not as cool as you expected. I'm sorry. And the games are all over the place again. Yay! And I know, I have said this several times in this video already, but I, as far as I can tell, can't change the Damocles sword of video game preservation into a teeny tiny baby platypus, okay? But at least we are beginning to see some publishers start to do something now. After wrestling with fan vanilla WoW servers for years, Blizzard themselves made World of Warcraft Classic. Besides the many decisions I personally will now only politely refer to as questionable mistakes. Uh, note from the future? While editing this video's audio, some serious harassment allegations with regards to Blizzard's work culture came to light. The word mistake is not meant to belittle any of the victims. And I know, at the time of recording, these are all just accusations still, but I personally am kinda over this whole... Uh, how do you call it? Giving companies big companies, I might add, the benefit of the doubt. If these accusations are true, I hope that the victims will get their justice with that lawsuit and that Activision Blizzard changes a lot. Future me over and out, let's get back to the video. And at least in promotion, video game companies became more aware of the history of their franchises, even if it's just for nostalgia's sake. On what current modern hardware without a U in its name can someone play Pokemon Pinball nowadays? Nintendo. By the way, what you have here now will and has only gotten more dire with regards to preservation projects for something as floaty as the internet. It appears to be right in its purging stage. 
Not many internet tech companies feel responsible for any preservation because old HTML experiments seem not to have any real value. Our now well-known obstacle copyright strikes again! Platform rules delete tons of content connected to potential future historical events and many features are only seen as a relic of past technical progress that should be moved on from. People are trying to save things. We will probably see how that develop in the next all of human time we have left, maybe? For a change, do now drag your sad hope onto its feet again. Let's get to the conclusion. The future of the gaming industry will only become more rocky in terms of preservation and even more difficult for academic archiving to keep up with. All those online game services like xCloud, parts of PlayStation Now and Google Stadia, I guess, and like the thing Amazon wants to do, will eventually disappear with the wind. Which would be less of an issue if not for the possibility on which many people bet on. Sentences hang in the air like Physical media is dying. Streaming will kill the cinema. Maybe Google Stadia faltered now, but everything will be streaming in 10 years. Who will buy CDs to play Rip Ribbon for PS1 or PS3? Of course, digital releases have advantages in terms of resources, availability and space. If we look past the non-renewable energy consumption of many servers, which is in my opinion also a problem many industries should take care of in the next few years, even if I think that physical releases will stay at least as a small collector's medium, we will have to deal with the preservation of every bit of streaming-only content we have. Right now, there are already streaming-only ports of bigger games like Control and Assassin's Creed Odyssey on Nintendo Switch whose servers will, you guessed it, go the way of the, in my opinion, coolest extinct flightless bird. Not to judge the developers, because it probably gets more difficult to quickly port big releases on that non-pro hardware. Especially with the next-gen releases those 4.5 PS5 owners play right now, raising the technical bar further and further. However, even looking at the old-fashioned release methods, updates, always online things and game discs only containing the tutorial took the safety out of the physical. It's good that games can be improved after release. Many old games would really have benefited from this, but we have to live now with this new fluidity of the medium. Finally, we also have to accept that some aspects of an experience just can't be preserved. Like the fact that you will never exactly 100% feel like the 14 year old that after finishing all the homework before the weekend watches in a weird resolution the last stretches of those colorful fan subbed animes with the subtitled OPs where the letters are flying away into carefreeness. I am old! But even with all this doom and gloom, I have the hope that the fans and pirates <coughs> will somehow continue to preserve the retro things they love, even if sadly the bigger companies will often not let them. But where is the will? There is a way! These past weeks, many parts of the gaming community showed so much will to at least rip the PlayStation 3 and PS3 stores from Sony's planned funerals. Even if they apparently did not remove the deadline for publishing games for the PS Vita store for some reason, and like the PSP ones the closest, making your PSP go once and for all a nice looking piece of memory, but you can at least buy PSP games in the PS Vita store, I think. But I, like probably most people, only have a PSP, so I don't know any specifics. <coughs> The community used its voice to achieve something, but this is only a small patch on the wound. In my opinion, the games industry should start more preservation efforts, or at least let them happen. The PS3 and PS Vita stores will someday, as we Germans also say, see the registers from below. Those servers will be shut off and your inconveniently placed console battery will be dead eventually. 
Before modders have unofficially solved these issues in a few years by peddling in the legal grey area, I think we should get some long term solutions from the people putting out the hardware and software in the first place. If not, then the big gaming companies could maybe just let the invested fans handle old IPs they don't see a need to make money off, but that will probably only stay in the realm of imagination. What do I know? I am not a lawyer. Maybe I just have to accept that nothing lasts forever. Hey, get away from the microphone. This channel is a not informational review zone only. If this is not a video about the slightly meddling but hopeful feelings you get after playing a game titled Game Preservation and You, then hop out. Who said that? The big sign you can totally see. I don't care. Actually, this is also a video essay. It even has a quote. I am an investigative journalist. That's not what investigative journalists do. Why are we all weak with word definitions? Wow, you're right for once. I am not telling you what to do with your job. Because you have to get paid, so it counts as a job. No, it doesn't. I think you get paid. Hey! Not to distract from anything as a boss, but aren't you the one training too much for the Hope Destroyer Championships 2022? Uh, uh, that's only a hobby. I am only here for truth and justice. <laughs> okay, I go. But I will have my revenge.